Greetings, Internet. I'm John Bailey, the Popcorn Junkie, and here's what I saw this week. Santos? Ulysses. Can you talk? Okay, that's not really talking, but still! So, Disney knows they don't have to make live-action movies, right? Because they aren't very good at it. I'm not saying that Disney's always been bad at live-action movies. It's just been recently, most of their live-action movies have been pretty bad, especially the ones that they're trying to adapt from kids' books. I mean, one of the best ones is a remake of a movie they did where they did adapt a kid's book. Yeah, that was a remake. Didn't know that, did you? For some reason, when they adapt these kids' books, they're just not good. Uh, like, the one that I can think of that's just at least okay was Bridge to Terabithia, but the book was so much better. Then you get into things like Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. More like Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Movie. Am I right? Yeah, I'm right. And recently, like, the stuff on Disney Plus that they've been that we've been getting, things like Artemis Fowl or Star Girl or uh, Timothy Failure, like all of these are adaptations from a book, but they're just not good movies. And I'm sorry to say that Flora and Ulysses, I didn't think was that good either. The premise isn't bad. Uh, in fact, maybe the book is better at it. But the idea of this superhero obsessed little girl coming into contact with a super powered squirrel. Like, yeah, that's silly and goofy. You could see that working in the comic books, even. Like, it's a great sort of send-up of the superhero genre. And yet they didn't really lean into that genre in this movie. I think my biggest issue was the lead kid. In fact, a lot of these movies suffer from bad leads. And that isn't to say that these ac kid actors are terrible, but they're just not very charismatic or interesting or, you know, directed well. And, like, that's the thing is, we've seen plenty of kid movie actors be great, excellent even, but a lot of these Disney kid actors feel wooden, stiff. Like, the kid here, she kind of suffers from the same issues I had with Timothy Failure, where the, where the character is like this cynical, know-it-all, bratty kid. She's not as bad as Timothy Failure was. Failure was a terrible character. Uh, at least in the movie. But here, like, her faux cynicism, realist take on things is just really bland and interesting. And she doesn't really give me anything to work with. Like, she's able to pull off the whole fangirl thing when it comes to superheroes, but she's not a very compelling or interesting actor when it comes to anything outside of being obsessed with superheroes. And even then, when her obsession is just kind of generic. It's not very unique or interesting in that regard. It's just kind of, oh, she's obsessed with superheroes, so she can name drop a couple things. But a lot of the name drops are for a fictional superhero that her dad made up that isn't even published. So it's like this weird obsession over a, like a niche thing. It's almost like she's a hipster fangirl. Her sidekick, friend, boy, next door, whatever, uh, he's also got this weird thing where he's got hysterical blindness. And that whole subplot just goes nowhere, and the kid is not very interesting. I think he's attempting to do a British accent, but if he's actually British and he sounds that bad, then... Hopefully that was just bad direction, kid. <laughs> Oof. The adult cast isn't much better either. Like, you've got Alison Hannigan here, who is a super charming, lovable actress, been in all kinds of things, going all the way back to Buffy and American Pie. She was charming and sweet and here, uh, How I Met Your Mother. And here, where's the charm? Where is her sweetness? Where is the things that we love about Alison Hannigan? They don't feel here. It feels like she gave up. <laughs> I mean, that's the whole thing with her character is that she's in a slump. She's an author in a slump. But it feels like Alison Hannigan herself wasn't even trying. Like, she's being upstaged by a CGI squirrel. Not just in the movie. Like, the squirrel writes this kind of poetry that really isn't very good, but it's treated like it's amazing. But Alison Hannigan herself, the actress, is being upstaged by a CGI squirrel in terms of believability and personality. Like, 
how does that happen? How how did the, how did you make Allison Hannigan boring? And it's not just her either. You I've seen this a lot. Jennifer Garner, especially when she does these kinds of kids movies, is just lifeless and flat and wooden. And I don't understand how you make these character these actresses who are good actresses this boring and uninteresting. How did you manage to suck out their personality? I will say though, it was kind of cute that we got a mini DuckTales reunion because in this movie you have Ben Schwartz as the dad, Danny Pudi as the sort of villain, Bobby Moynihan does show up at one point, and then Danny Pudi gets a little bit of a love, love interest in Kate Micucci. So there you've got Huey, Dewey, Louie, and Webby from the new DuckTales all in one movie. It was cute. I got that. I will say that of the actors in this movie, Schwartz was actually the best. Like Schwartz is able to be to switch between melodrama and comedic fairly easily. Like he's able to do the whole melodrama, like "Oh, kid, it's okay. Our lives are we have problems and blah blah blah." But you know the family melodrama garbage. But then he's able to switch between that and like silly slapstick, cartoony stuff. So I mean, Schwartz is a very capable actor, and I kind of wish he got better material than this because he's really capable. The other one who's obviously capable and a, and a great actor is Danny Pudi. And uh, maybe he's good. The director of this also did this um, uh, Indian American sort of movie that was in both English and Hindi. It deals with uh, um, Indian Americans, and uh, I I'm not familiar with it, but uh, apparently Danny Pudi was the star, and I'm willing to at least check it out because, I mean, Danny Pudi. He's so underutilized. Here he's playing the sort of antagonist, villain. He's this over-enthusiastic uh, wildlife... What are, you, what are they called? Um, what are they called? Uh, animal control. Uh, animal control officer. And he's so obsessed with catching the squirrel because he's just dead set on believing that it has rabies. And thinking we need to bring this squirrel in because it's a danger to the community, and it's Pooty is playing up that sort of cartoonish villain, and I think he could he's he's very capable of being like he's very capable of being being a charismatic lead and comedic lead like we've seen that in in his other stuff, but here he's actually being a comedic villain, and I think he's cap I think it proves that when he's that he can play that kind of type well enough and I think he I think he should be given the opportunity to once again in a better written movie where he's got more stuff to do and I also will say that uh the CG effects aren't that bad um they're not terrible like they blend in with the background enough that you believe it's there the main CG effects are Ul Ulysses the squirrel and this recurring cat that continually attacks Danny Pudi and um both effects are fairly decent. Like, you can clearly tell they're CG effects. They're not as good as, say, um, Buck from the Call of the Wild movie from last year. That one was a that one was clearly CG, but it was rendered a lot better. Here, Ulysses is the best effect, but they're also, once again, these effects aren't terrible. They're, they're good effects. They don't distract from the movie. I'll give them that. But for a movie that tried to sell itself as like this subversion of a lot of the superhero tropes and superhero genre, it doesn't really lean into that at all. Like, sure, the kid references a bunch of superhero stuff and Disney pumps in a bunch of Marvel references because they own it. But even like the superheroes that she references that her dad made up, they'll show up as like imaginary friends and then do nothing. They're just there because kids have imaginations, I guess. But it doesn't, they don't affect anything. They don't really matter to the plot. They're just there, probably because they were more, they were more impactful in the book. But, um, yeah, it's this bizarre, it's so bizarre that you, you have this opportunity to really play up superhero movies and the genre, uh, with Ulysses and discovering, like, you know, the kid discovering superheroes superhero works aren't you know like the comics they're entirely different in the real world there's some of that here but it's not well defined so much more of this movie is about the melodrama of her parents being separated and on the verge of divorce and it's like okay 
that's fine enough, I guess, but her mom isn't very interesting of that interesting of a character. Her dad's fine enough. He has this whole um you know, he, he has a lot he has some self confidence issues and whatnot. And it's through this whole adventure that he rediscovers his love of superheroes, like play that up more like be more into that but make that part of the story but uh, it, it, this whole thing felt like a missed opportunity like they could have leaned harder into the superhero stuff be a subversion of those tropes in the genre play up the fact that it's about superheroes and you know s lampshade some things and you know e you know emphasize certain other ones and it's like you know play around in the space and they were just like, oh, hey, the squirrels got superpowers. We're not going to show a lot of that because that would cost money. And then we're just not going to do anything with it, really. Because why would we? Why would we try when we could not? I don't want to make it sound like I'm dogging this movie. I, I, there's a bunch of people that I follow who really liked it. And I don't want to make it seem like they were wrong for being into it. I personally was not. It's not terrible by the, you know, compared to things like Timothy Failure, Stargirl, Artemis Fowl, all that other crap that's on Disney+. Plus. This is not a bad movie. I just think given the source material, maybe that's better. Uh, and given the subject matter, they could play around more in the space and be more interesting, be more unique. Uh, but a lot of it is just the usual Disney family melodrama garbage. And I'm not, I, maybe it's some producer at Disney who just keeps pumping out this specific genre and thinks, oh, this is the, this is amazing. This is what we should put our names on. And I'm like, try harder. You're Disney. You can afford to try harder. I am a fucking lioness. what hurts about this is that I really like Rosamund Pike and I think she's and I was very interested to see where this movie was gonna go because I like oh there she's playing this sort of villainous character and it's and it's supposed and I'm very curious to see what exactly they have planned for her and I was hoping it would be a good movie I would have even accepted an average movie but that's not what we got Here's the thing about writing reprehensible characters. It's not that people should avoid doing it. Writing, th creating stories that showcase a lot of actual reprehensible personalities and people and, you know, correlations to the real world, that's not a problem. The problem arises when you don't, when you kind of end up siding with those reprehensible people and making it sound like them being awful is a good thing. You see that a lot in a lot of really bad movies where they play up the fact that being awful is reward. They're rewarded for being awful. You see it a lot in like really bad Christian cinema where they play up these sort of toxic uh, behaviors and make it make it feel and romances too like really bad romances play up the sort of toxic personality and make it seem like that's rewarding that should be rewarded for being that reprehensible and that's where people take on people you know are rightfully taking umbrage with it here you've got a very very reprehensible character a woman who absolutely who makes her entire living by exploiting the elderly. That's one of the most reprehensible things you can make a character do. So you'd think, being that this is a reprehensible character, we'd get some form of catharsis. Basic storytelling 101, something that goes all the way back to like the ancient Greeks at least. Catharsis happens when you see something, when you get some relief from a story, from a, from an event in a character. I mean, that can happen in real life, too. You can have real-life catharsis. You know, things like working so hard and then finally seeing that success pay off. That's a, cathar that's a cathartic moment. See, for when it comes to reprehensible characters, our catharsis 
comes from seeing them fail or seeing them lose everything. Seeing us seeing their bad behavior be punished in some regard, either by them failing at what their uh, what their goals are or by them losing everything else so that they could reach their goals and then being left with nothing. That's a cathar that's a that's how you deal with these reprehensible characters. You make a you make us feel this form of catharsis by showing us that they are punished in some way, not like legally punished, but like cosmically punished. Feel you know, seeing them lose everything in one way or another. That's how you deal with these characters. That was the whole point of Breaking Bad. That's what it all led up to was this cathartic moment of seeing every action that uh, Walter White took come back to bite him in some way. You see that catharsis by seeing this reprehensible character, plus the journey that he became more reprehensible as the show went on. So you see this man become more reprehensible, become more awful, and then he gets his comeuppance. That's our catharsis. Usually comes from another old Greek term, hubris, meaning their ego, their, their lack of foresight, there's some personal flaw of theirs. Even George Lucas in the prequels understood that, because even there he attempted to give Anakin some form of hubris and seeing him become Darth Vader was supposed to come from some cathartic moment of him losing everything. Even Lucas, even, even though he couldn't execute it, well, he understood that that's how you write these kinds of characters. For some reason, this movie decided, nah, they should be rewarded for being awful. Because everything is awful. Everything sucks in this movie's universe. Because not only is this woman reprehensible for the way she exploits the elderly, but when she, it finally comes down to her getting her comeuppance, she doesn't even get that. She doesn't really get any comeuppance. She doesn't... She loses, like, one doctor and one apartment. That's it. Maybe a car. But she doesn't lose her, lose her love interest. She doesn't lose her fortune. She doesn't lose her reputation. She, she maintains all of that. Because she's a girl boss. I am not the right channel to delve into that sort of trope, that sort of character type in depth. I will say this much. You can make that work in a story. You can make the whole theming of a woman finding empowerment through you know, corporate ladder climbing, I guess you want to call it. I don't know, whatever the equivalents are, but her standing up to sexism at executive levels and her overcoming these obstacles in her way. Yeah, that kind of story, that's fine. I have no issues with that. But this movie is trying to paint a woman who exploits the elderly and taking on and takes on the some ex-Russian mobsters when she when she kidnaps their mom, one the leader's mom as her being a tough Take no prisoners, girl boss. I have many questions, which I won't get into too much here, but the main question is, why? Why was this your decision for this character? Why, instead of the much more obvious, cathartic, you know, collapsing empire, Pyrrhic victory sort of story, why instead did you make it about girl boss takes on the mob to keep exploiting the elderly? Like, it would be one thing if it was like she was offering security, insurance, something that would cut into the mob's, you know, bottom line, and she was taking on the mob. That's not an issue. But you made her entire job to exploit the elderly. 
And when she rightfully is getting some comeuppance for kidnapping the wrong person's mom, it becomes about her overcoming the mob, who are clearly the bad guys because they're the mob. It's not her, the woman who exploits and abuses the elderly. I think what makes it even worse is that she is given such brand X Aaron Sorkin grade dialogue to speak. Oh my God, that they write, they wrote her like they were trying to write a co some co sort of corporate inspirational speech. Something that said it like retreats for Geico or, or AT&T or something. Something that executives would make you sit through. It is so up its own ass. And they make her sound like this, you know, talking about predator and prey. Are you a lion or are you a lamb? You're an abuser of the elderly. You're a monster. Fuck you. You don't get to come in here on your high horse and act like you're like you're breaking through some kind of glass ceiling. No. Fuck you. Fuck out of here with that shit. Fuck you. Like, once again, this plot could work. A female empowerment story facing the mob. They did this with the kitchen. The kitchen tried this and did it better. The kitchen handled female empowerment, girl boss sort of theming, uh, facing against the mafia way better than this movie did. And that movie faltered quite a bit. But nah, nah, you don't get to come in here after abusing the elderly and pretend like, oh, I'm be it's all about women's empowerment and face, you know, not letting, you know, men keep you down. No. This isn't about that. You abuse the elderly. What makes you think this is about your empowerment? You're, you're a monster. We're not rooting for you. Which makes it even worse because this whole cast is decent. I, I don't know much about Aza Gonzalez. Uh, I'm not familiar with her work. Um, but Rosamund Pike, amazing actress, wonderful actress, great actress. She's basically made to be a lesser version of her character from Gone Girl. It was like her favorite character was went from Gone Girl became a corporate level exploiter of the elderly, and yeah, she is just given absolute garbage to work with. Meanwhile, Diane Weist, a wonderful actress in her own right, it basically feels like she's wandered onto the wrong set. That's all she does. They do with her. She may as well been a prop. And then of course you've got Peter Dinklage as the ex Russian mobster, and Peter Dinklage is a Fantastic actor. Great actor. Not here he isn't, because he, he def, I definitely get the feeling that he understood that this material is garbage, so he doesn't need to try. There's no reason for him to try for this either, so I don't blame him, because, my God, they didn't, for a mush, Russian mobster, they didn't make him intimidating at all. And you can make Peter Dinklage intimidating. Peter Dinklage can be intimidating, you just are a bad filmmaker if you can't do that. If you can't make Peter Dinklage intimidating as an ex-Russian mobster taking on this abuser of the elderly, then you have failed. You have failed as a storyteller and a filmmaker. Wow, have you failed. I'll say this much. People may rate this worse than music because it is that awful. I mean, we're talking like very close. But the thing with me is music was more reprehensible across the board. Like it was reprehensible in its treatment of the, of the autistic for one thing, but then how it treated its black character, how it treated its Asian characters, how it just, it is filmmaking in general. And then just everything about it is a glitter or showgirls grade debacle on top of being absolutely offensive. I care a lot is mainly offensive in one regard. The people who like good movies. Like, this is just a terrible execution of this kind of story. And it is terrible writing, uh, piss-poor acting, and it's just all around completely misses the mark by a country mile. So yeah, this whole endeavor was a waste. So it's not as bad as music, but... Yeah, this is this is gonna be the bottom of a lot of people's uh, 2021 movie list.
because my god, you may as well have not even tried. Is it gonna become a thing? Are we just gonna have a thing where like every year we get a movie about repeating a day over and over again? I'm not saying that people are being lazy or that, you know, it's bad to do this kind of story. It's just that we had what we had Groundhog's Day in like 93 or something like that. Then nothing for like 20 years, and then all of a sudden, a deluge of stories about reliving the same day over and over again. And most of them referencing Groundhog's Day in one way or another. It's kind of weird that we keep that this keeps happening. Feels like we're reliving the same story over and over again. As for this movie, it's charming. Uh, it's a decent enough story. Like, the, it's kind of does a sort of Palm Springs approach where there's two people stuck in the loop. Uh, but instead of one of the characters following into the loop, it's this guy has already been living in the loop. And then he runs into somebody else who has already, who has also been living in the loop. And he becomes obsessed with her. And trying to, and they form a sort of friendship. It becomes like this tepid romance, but it's only one way. And it's it's a lot of young adult romance garbage. I wasn't really into that part. But um, I'll say this much: Kyle Allen, the lead actor here, he's got potential. I would not be surprised if he went on to be a leading man in some regard, at least on TV or something like that, because. The dude has a lot of uh, charm to him, and if given good material, he would be excellent as a sort of leading man character, or maybe a love interest, or like a, something. He uh, he's could he's able to do the sort of melodrama thing. I wouldn't be surprised if he could make that switch into full-on comedy. He's got some decent timing, so he's good in this movie. I wasn't into Catherine Newton all that much, though. Like, the whole movie deals with uh, Alan's character being obsessed with her, thinking like, oh my god, she's amazing. But I didn't see what he saw. Like, I didn't get the feeling that she was amazing. I got the feeling that she was a bitter... Once again, this sort of cynicism for lack of a personality thing is something I'm seeing a lot of. I think it's because a lot of writers see themselves as being cynical. And what that basically means is they're an asshole who wants to try and differentiate themselves by being an asshole and saying, I'm just being real. I'm keeping it real. It's the keeping it real of writing story, writing characters. And like, nah, you know, nah, man. Like, you being cynical doesn't mean you have a personality now. It just means you're an asshole and you aren't, you aren't willing to at least admit you're an asshole. But then at the same time, she'll all of a sudden be all into him uh, showing all the, these crazy perfect moments uh, around town and playing up this romance bit and then completely do a 180 and be like not into him at all and it's like if it doesn't feel it feels like she was two separate characters combined into one and part of it is like I'm a cynical I know you know blah, 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 I know so much and then all of a sudden oh wow isn't this amazing are you a cynic or are you not are you being cynical or are you just pretending to be cynical? Uh, it, it's the writer pretending to be cynical in lieu of a personality. Never mind. I think it also kind of doesn't sit well with me that it tries to play up the whole, like, unreciprocated feelings and the guy having to get over his own ego because the girl doesn't like him back. And that would be one thing if they didn't end up together. But the movie makes sure they end up together because of course they do. They're the two leads. Of course they end up together. Why wouldn't they end up together? Why can't they just be platonic friends who have shared the same experience? Why couldn't that be the end of the story, guys? What? <laughs> what, we can, people, men and women can't be friends now? Oh, nah, no, nah, of course not. Not in young adult romance. Now nah, the two leads have to end up together. Otherwise, what was the point? It can't have been about them growing as people, having mutual respect, and just staying friends and not hooking up. Don't mind me. I, let me climb off up my soapbox here. But, yeah, like, it's... It, it, this whole thing... And then, once it actually focuses on uh, the girl, 
It becomes all about her over, you know, dealing with the fact that her mom's dying of cancer. Okay. Apparently that's the thing now. It can't, you know, she can't just not be into the guy. She has to be dealing with the trauma of, you know, losing somebody to cancer. Man, the the hurdles that some of these writers do to stick with the usual tropes of a genre, you know? I think a lot of these issues that I'm noticing come from the fact that this was adapted from a short story. It was adapted by the author, and you can really feel that this was based on a short story because there is a lot of padding. Like, it's not just padding, it's padding and then it's just like aimless meandering. Because like, there's the bit, the whole, the title refers to something they do in the second act where they map out all of these perfect moments that they, that they find uh, throughout the town they live in. You know, things like um, a janitor, you know, showing he's a, a talented musician or some little girl proving she's good at, be at being on a skateboard to a bunch of dudes who suck at it. Or uh, watching an eagle grab a fish like from six feet away. Or a shot of a dude who um, is sitting at a perfect point where uh, the, the wings on a, on a van make it look like he's an angel. You know, weird little idiosyncrasies like that. And so a bunch of the movie is just that. And it feels like they just padded it out because there was nothing else story-wise to happen. It was just, here's a bunch of things that happened for this map that ultimately doesn't matter. And I feel like, like, it's one thing that the map doesn't matter and get or get them out of the get them out of the loop but it just like at least kind of have a point and it, this doesn't really have much of it definitely feels like they had the main story realized it was too short and just like pumped it full of air to kind of fill out the the empty space you know that's the thing is that you could sometimes adapt a short story into being a feature length and it works because you expound on certain things that the story didn't. This movie doesn't really expound that much on what's going on. It's just it just kind of pads the story out to make it feature length. I think the biggest waste is that by the end there's a point going into the third act where um the where the dude is like I just realized it's not about me. I thought I was the hero. Turns out she was the hero all along. And then we shift focus to her perspective. But then there's only 20 minutes left in the movie. Not counting the credits. So you basically just decided to switch up the perspective 20 minutes before the end. To try and make it seem like you learned something. Why not, why not showcase their perspectives equally... And then have him personally realize... Like, I get the gimmick. I get the gimmick that you're switching the perspective because he realizes it's not about him. Why not just showcase more about her? Show her perspective and then have him realize that he was being an egotistical dude and then then shift more focus over to her? Like, why, are, why spend all this time with the dude and then 20 minutes at the, before the end decide, whoop, we're flipping the script? It feels like a. It just feels like a gimmick, more than anything. It feels like a wasted opportunity when we could have been spending more time with her and learning more about her. But they decided just to cram it all in the last twenty minutes. And not to mention the fact that for all of these movies that do the whole Groundhog's Day reference and be like, "Oh, looks like we're living in Groundhog Day." You remember that movie? That sure was a movie that happened, and it sure did share this same premise. Yeah, for all of that, they missed the point of Groundhog's Day, which is, it was about Bill Murray becoming a better person, not trying to understand why he's stuck in a loop. Like, fun bit of trivia here. The studio demanded that Harold Ramis and Danny Rubin explain where the loop came from. And specifically, they were like, what, you want to make it a gypsy curse? Then they're just like, yep, make it a gypsy curse. Because that would have kept it a classic for sure. Making sure, and they even shot the scene. They shot the scene 
where Bill Murray runs into the gypsy and gets cursed to be in the loop. That was almost in the movie, and Harold Ramis rightfully decided, nah, that ain't going in there because it's stupid and misses the point. It's a terrible idea to try and explain it because we didn't need an explanation. Now, every movie that does this has to go into fourth dimensional theoretical physics and seeing the numbers flash by like it's a beautiful mind or whatever. And it's like, uh, we don't need you to take, a, take like 10 minutes out of the movie to explain theoretical physics to us in order to m explain why there's a loop. Like, just, it's magic. You don't have to explain shit, you know? It's just, just let the thing happen and focus on the characters. That's the main thing that made Groundhog's Day work, and it's the one thing that these movies keep fucking up. It's the one thing that is the main thing that made Groundhog's Day so, so much fun. Like, imagine, imagine the timeline where we got Groundhog's Day and it, and we had to deal with the fact that it's, that it perpetuates the whole gypsy curse trope. Like, imagine that timeline where we hit, where people were adamantly defending, Groundhog's Day is a great movie. It perpetuates the gypsy stereotype. Yeah, well, it's a great movie. And we had to, we had to deal with stupid, stupid fanboys defending a movie that perpetuates that horrible stereotype and, you know, further, you know, further perpetuates, the, you know, the, this idea of the Romani people in a bad light because some studio executive just refused to let something go unexplained. And that would be a terrible timeline. I don't want to live in a timeline where we have to defend a, the, the gypsy curse trope in, a, in Groundhog's Day. It was rightfully cut and left out and we don't need it. And that's the thing is, if you're going to do this story, you don't need to mention Groundhog's Day because you're just being a, me a meta-referencing, self, you know, self-referential, like, oh, look at us, we're referencing Groundhog's Day. Yeah, yeah, we, we are original. You're pointing out how unoriginal you are. Like when um, Happy Death Day did it, it was a cute reference at the end. And it was just a throwaway joke. And, like, nowadays it's just, like, y you have to show how smart you are by referencing the fact that Groundhog's Day exists. Because you can't just let the story be itself. Ugh. It didn't help that towards the end, and I think what is the actual climax, is Catherine Newton going the beautiful mind or um, uh, uh, goodwill hunting and, like, uh, seeing the numbers. It's all coming together now. Fourth dimensional cube! And... It, it reeks of something that would be posted to r slash I am very smart. I'll say that much. Like, oh, look at us. Oh, we are so smart. Look at our smartness. I am smart. I am so smart. You aren't smart for trying to point do all of this stuff. You're actively just trying to make us think you're smart. Just get to the point, dude. And yeah, it ultimately doesn't really amount to anything, I don't think. I, once again, I, this whole thing has felt weird and not very coherent. Maybe because it was badly adapted from a short story. Like, I'm not even trying to say that the movie is bad. There's really bad young adult romance movies out there. I think my issue is it's trying so hard. It really wants you to make you, make you think it's smart. But it's just so lazy. You know, it's that kind of smart where the person thinks they're so smart that they don't have, they can, they can half-ass it, and it's just kind of lazy. So they're not really smart. They may be smart. Who knows how smart they are? But they don't try that hard, and they're not really putting in the effort to make it better. So, yeah, it's not, you know, it's not bad, but it's not very good either. It's just meh. And I can be certain in my heart. I'll see you again. wondering when the awards bait was going to start coming in. I've mentioned before on my old podcast that I've never been much for the for your consideration genre. The movies that are very clearly aimed for critics and especially for the awards uh, committees, the people who nominate awards. 
it I always felt like those try way too hard without really doing much you know things like the artist uh, or boyhood um, I didn't I'm not even saying that they're bad movies a lot of times they are well-made movies but man they are real it, it feels like uh, they're saying eh eh didn't we do good eh eh there's something you want to give us uh, yeah, yeah, there's that Oscar. Ah, uh, yeah, we totally deserve this. This isn't nearly as bad as a lot of For Your Consideration type of movies go. Um, in fact, it's it, it's it's a very decent movie. It's a solid, you know, very well-made movie. It just didn't really hook me in that much because I've never been one for this type of genre. Um, but I'll give this movie this. It's at least interesting. It's at least trying to deal with interesting themes and topics. Uh, the the whole idea of like Francis McDormand uh, as Fern become become kind of loses everything essentially because she's already lost her husband. She had managed to maintain this one job at a factory in the maybe may, maybe not fictional city of uh, Empire Nevada, and once that factory shuts down, she's without a job. And so, kind of without any real um, other options, she is um, put onto this idea by a friend of hers that says, "Look, why don't you become a nomad?" And basically, nomads are the are these people. This is kind of the collective term for this group of people that live out of their vehicles, but aren't like homeless. Homeless, you know, they're more essentially like willingly mobile. Like, they, they don't tie themselves down to a singular home. They go around, find work where they can. They're nomadic. And uh, so Fern decides that she's going to take her friend up on that and become a nomad. And then it becomes about, you know, the pros and cons about living as a nomadic, living this nomadic lifestyle. And especially it becomes, you know, at, towards the end, it becomes about Fern's you know, never, Fern never really dealing with her issues. Like, it doesn't matter if she's nomadic or not, but a lot of these issues, a lot of, a lot of the stuff in this movie, she could work out in therapy. Not like perfectly. Therapy doesn't solve all your problems, but I mean, just talking about these issues and working through them is, would help a lot. And yeah, so I don't know if she'd become nomadic or not if she went to therapy. Maybe, maybe not. That the therapy doesn't solve all your problems. But it helps. At least you're trying something. The other thing that the other kind of subplot that happens while uh, Fern is going about being nomadic is she does continue to run into this uh, guy named David, played by another great actor, David Strathairn, and uh, they have a little bit of a romance, mainly one-sided. Uh, David is more into Fern than she's into him, but um, there's a bit of a subplot there, and. Uh, it, 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 and so that kind of the there only there's not really a plot plot. It's actually kind of nomadic in terms of its storytelling. It's just going on a road trip. Here's here's the next bit. Here's the next bit. Here's, there's not a really overarching story going on. And I think the book this is based on is nonfiction, so that would explain it. I don't know for sure, but there is a book that this is based on called Nomadland. And I believe it is a more non-fictional book that just chronicles the lives of these nomadic people. And I think that's kind of why this feels more like here's the lives of these nomadic people more than it is a traditional like story narrative. See, the interesting thing I think is that in lieu of extras and regular actors, uh, Chloe Zhao, um, or whoever made the decision, I'm assuming it was her, decided to go and cast these actual nomadic people that, are, and one of them is like one of the big guys in this whole movement, this whole community. Uh, I forget his name, Bob something, but he actually like makes vlogs and talks about life on the road, helps people get started on this, and makes it about um, how to live this nomadic lifestyle. And having these people play essentially themselves gives this sort of authenticity that you wouldn't really get from having the actors there. 
Like, having actors portray these people would be one thing. Most people wouldn't even tell the difference. But by incorporating these actual nomads into this story, into this thing about their life, it plays up the fact that these are real people and makes it feel authentic. And especially since David Strathairn and Francis McDormand kind of disappear into these roles. So they begin, begin to kind of, they're more like camouflaging in amongst the actual nomads while being actors. And so the actual acting is left up to them, whereas when you're dealing with these, with, with the nomads and their lifestyle, you're dealing with the actual people. And I respect that, and I think that's a that was a that was a good choice on uh, Zhao's part. Not to mention that you know they don't shy away from the fact that this isn't exactly a perfect lifestyle. It's a hard lifestyle, and a lot of people get into it not because they want to, because there are no other op like Fern. There are no other options. A lot of these people are victims of the recession, and so they're stuck with this lifestyle because the alternative is true homelessness and being nowhere. And being, you know, and that's the other thing too, like, it comments on the fact that a lot of these people are victims of capitalism. Like, they acknowledge that a lot of these people, there's the, uh, I don't know if it was Bob or somebody else, but somebody makes the metaphor that they are workhorses and rather than have them set up after their work, after they can't work anymore, they're just forgotten about and disposable by society, by capitalism. And... And so it does acknowledge that that's part of it. So a lot of these people, some of these people want freedom, and then some of these people are victims of the recession and have nowhere else to go, and so they pick in, get into this lifestyle, and then maybe they learn to love it or not, but what it, it is what it is, and a lot of these people, you know, there's no real alternative for them. So it does acknowledge that, a lot, that there's this sort of background in people just being forgotten by society because of how disposable everything is and how little we care for each other, that these people are left to fend for themselves and so they feel the need to just pull up stakes and just, you know, live out of their vehicles. And then, not to mention the fact that, yeah, you're living out of your vehicle, which means car problems are now home problems. If your vehicle becomes so broken and busted that you can't use it anymore, that's your home. You invested all of this, all of this money and in time and energy into fitting this vehicle to work as your home, and now it's busted and it can't and it won't work anymore. You're out of a home, and you're stuck. So that means you're. <laughs> so yeah, and that's about the fact that because we still live in a capitalistic society, we live in a society. Oh, it's almost time for that nonsense. Got to be a couple of weeks now. But because we live in a capitalistic society, you still need money for gas, for whatever phone bills you may have, because you still may have a phone on you, uh, for car repairs, for all you know, for all basic amenities, for your food, and so you will need to work in some regard. And a lot of these work, a lot of that work is grunt work, is minimum wage. Take what you can get, seasonal work. You're not getting, you're, you're taking whatever scraps you can get from capitalism at that point. So you're not officially getting out of the system. You're just scraping along the bottom of it, sadly. And, and once again, but while that's going on, you also have the freedom to see so many of the things that a lot of people don't because they're stuck in the rat race. They're stuck in the cubicles. They're stuck taking care of this home. So they don't get the chance to see so many of the beautiful vistas and landscapes and, you know, life around us. But at the same time, you also get to see the vestiges of, you know, predatory capitalism as well. And you're kind of stuck picking up the pieces along the way. So, I mean, yeah, it's not a perfect lifestyle. And, you know, it's not for everybody. Like, there's a bit where... I don't know if it was Frances McDormand herself or somebody had to poop in a bucket. There it is. Yeah, some days you have to poop in a bucket because any port in a storm. You just take what you can get. And uh, not everybody can handle that lifestyle. And it, the story deals with Fern dealing with her own issues and seeing this lifestyle as just a means to get by. And boy, does she have a lot of issues that she never really addresses. But uh, yeah. It is, it, is a, it is a good movie. This is a solid movie. 
And probably the best one I saw... Mm, we'll get into the next one. That one's also really good. But um, yeah, recommended movie, decent movie. Not as good as people are like playing it up to be. It feels a lo it feels a lot more catered to that uh, for your consideration crowd. The people that are really people that are really into art movies and art house kind of cinema will probably love this. But yeah, it's it's really reserved and quiet and kind of meandering, not kind of aimless at a lot of the points. And it just you know it it feels like it's not very cohesive. It feels like they are trying to. Make it basically like a glorified documentary. And yeah, it's it's not bad. It's just, this isn't my type of movie. This isn't why I get into movies. And uh, at the same point, like, yeah, Frances McDormand is great. When is she not? Chloe Zhao was a good job, did a good job. She's a good director. She should, she should get more work. And uh, that's about it. I'm Barb, and this is Star. What number again, please, sir? 611. 611? Oh my, Barb. Oh my gosh, he's 6'11". 6'11"? We're in 124. <laughs> Holiday. So, I think Nomadland was the best made movie that I saw this week. I think this one might actually be the one I liked the most. Y'all are probably familiar with Kristen Wiig by now, and if not, Former SNL uh, performer and uh, consummate uh, comedic actress. And uh, she decided to team back up with the woman she co-wrote Bridesmaids with, Annie Momolo. And they decided to bring us Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mar. And I say that because they're from Nebraska and they got this deep, thick Midwestern accent throughout the whole movie. They talk like this throughout the whole movie, don't you? Now you'd think, since Kristen Wiig can be hit or miss depending on the comedy, especially since, you know, a lot of her comedies are very improv-driven, and, you know, improv is by its nature very raw and unfiltered and not very refined, but her and Momolo, you know, you'd think this was something that they workshopped, that they created back of the groundlings that was fine-tuning until it was finally ready, but no, this is just two creations that they came up with, and... They're amazing. Barb and Star are wonderful, and I love them. Now, I will give you all a spoiler warning. I didn't really uh, talk about spoiler warnings for um, I Care A Lot or um, or um, the Map of Perfect things or whatever, but here, I don't think you should go into this knowing what happens. I think you're better off, like I was, going into this blind. So if you haven't seen this yet, by all means, stop the video, go watch it, and then come back. Because a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about is going to spoil things. And especially the stuff I'm critical about. And I would much rather you experience the movie for yourself than come back and talk about it. Rather than me spoil it for you and then you go check it out for yourself with that bias in your head. So go into this sign and scene. I recommend it for sure. But see it for yourself. Form your own opinions, then come back and talk about it. Because it's interesting. I'll say that much. It's an interesting movie. Before all this go to, when, before going into this, all I knew was that Barb and Star were these Midwestern marns, and they, and they ended up going to Vista Del Mar. Say that ten times fast. <laughs> I, had, I had an aunt who talked exactly like that. A great aunt. She was, ah, oh, ah, oh, honey, did you, did you make pasta for dinner? She never talked like that before. My mom grew up with her, and she never talked like that before. And then all of a sudden, but towards the end of her life, she's like, ah, are you getting lasagna? Is that you make your pasta for dinner, baby? <laughs> That's all I could think about. That's all I could think about watching this movie. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, so these two, Annie Momolo and Kristen Wiig play Barb and Star. Um, I think that's actually, yeah, collect, yeah. Um, no, uh, Wig is Barb, Momolo is Star, I believe. Now I don't remember which is which. <laughs> but, um, they are, they work in this furniture store and then eventually they, you know, they end up kind of losing both their, their jobs and their friend group. And so they're kind of like at a loss. And so after 
dad bumped into Wendy McClendon Covey uh, from the from the Goldbergs and Reno 911 fame. Uh, she had come back from this place called Vista Del Mar. And she was like, oh, you got to check this out. It's amazing. Check out my tan. And so these women are like, well, we got nothing else going on. So like, Let's go down to Vista Del Mar. And uh, while there, because that's the thing, the movie opens up with this whole Bond, you know, Bond parody opening. Not like the, the theme, like Bond theme opening, like actual like spice parody stuff going on. And then all the play, which is where uh, Christian Wiig's second character comes in, this super villainess who is out to send forth a swarm of killer mosquitoes onto Vistel Del Mar for slighting her. And there's this whole subplot spy parody that's going on that came right the hell out of nowhere. And um, so it is by mere happenstance, Barb and Star get roped into this whole plot. By just happening to be in the right place at the right time. And running into Jamie Dornan from the Fifty Shades movies. Thankfully, he's actually given stuff to do that isn't reprehensible. Nah, instead of being an abusive, toxic piece of shit, he is an emotionally available and and thirsting guy who just wants some woman to love him as much as he loves her. And at first he thinks it's going to be the supervillain character this bond villain wannabe <laughs> that Kristen Wiig is playing and she and he and he getting nothing from her and that's when he runs into Kristen Wiig as Barb and or star uh, I think Wiig is Barb I want to say now I'm curious who does Kristen Wiig play Barb or star Wiig is star and and Mumolo is Barb so that's who it is Mumolo is Barb and Wiggit, I was right. I got it right the first time. But yeah, as soon as he runs into Wig's other character, Star, he is like he kind of like starts to fall for her. Uh, he has a bit of a falling for uh, Mumolo's Barb as well. But the main love interest is between um, Dornan and Wig. Actually, the love triangle is between Wig, Wig, and Dornan. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love this crap. It's so stupid, and I love it. But um. Dornan, Dornan's character is this emotionally, you know, uh, thirsty guy. Not thirsty as in, like, um, thirsting after women, but, like, he wants this emotional connection that he's not getting. And so he is, he finds it through Star, and the movie becomes about, the, that whole subplot becomes about how Dornan is stuck between this villain who is em employing him and, you know, stringing him along, or... You know, how does he really feel about Star and do they think that can go somewhere? Because he genuinely likes her and she genuinely likes him back. And um, meanwhile, he's there to send out, set off the bomb of mosquitoes and destroy and kill everybody within Vista Del Mar. <laughs> um, so yeah, that I think that's kind of... That's the thing. The first half of this is amazing. Wig and Mumolo nail these characters. Doran is is like... Complete 180 charm offensive. He is so charming, and he has he has a decent singing voice, which I didn't know. Like, dude is genuinely talented and charming, and he got saddled with freaking you know, it's like the Robert Pattinson thing with Twilight. Like Pattinson and Wig and um and Stewart, different Kristen. Pattinson and Stewart are amazing actors, but we they were tainted for almost a decade because of Twilight. Thankfully, Dakota Johnson and Jamie Dornan are not being, are not, don't have that whole decade. I think we've kind of gotten past the point of blaming the actors for the roles. But yeah, like Dornan, Dornan could be a leading dude in a comedy like that. Dude has got the comedic timing. Dude has got the talent for it. He's got the charm for it. Um, he's still got a bit of that Fifty Shades stink on him, but I think that's just because we're still dealing with the repercussions of Fifty Shades. So I think a couple more movies where he's like this comedic love interest, or if nothing else, like a comedic character, will finally get the stink of Fifty Shades off of him. But uh, yeah, J Dornan is great in this movie. Like he does a complete 180 uh, from the Fifty Shades movie and proves, okay, he can stay. Dude, that dude can stay because he's charming, he's got good singing voice, and he's funny. And it's like, okay, you're good. 
you're good, Dornan. You're off the shit list. So let's see what you do next. And yeah, like it's fun. And then of course you've got all these other comedic actors in and about the place. I've mentioned Wendy McClendon Covey, but you've also got Vanessa Bayer, a fellow SNL alum. You've also got Phyllis Smith from The Office and Inside Out. You've got Fort Fortune Feenster, a great comedian uh, who looks unrecognizable here because I'm so used to her with the short hair. And here she's got a full on Hillary Clinton grade, like, like well, I don't know what you call that look, but she's got a full on Western mom wig on. I did not recognize her at all. But uh, you got Damon Wayans Jr. coming in at one point, and yeah, like, um, yeah, just uh, all of these really talented comedic actors filling out the su the the supporting cast, and high, just all all fantastic. And um, I think the main faltering point I had was when they tried to get into the plot, like when it's just Barb and Star in Vista Del Mar. <laughs> It's fun. It's 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 funny. It's charming. It's 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 great. And then the more they try to bring in this spy parody, the less fun it is. And then by the end, I'm just like, man, y'all didn't have to do this, you know? Like this whole spy thing kind of falls apart, and it really it's really you know not fun by the end because it's trying too hard to be in this plot. And I'm like. You didn't really need that plot. It didn't even need to be a big plot. It didn't need to be this super over-the-top plot. But I guess that's kind of the point is that it's so over-the-top and stupid. It's kind of campy in that way. And yeah, this is all kinds of camp and fun and silly. And I love it. Like, I would absolutely rewatch this again. I'm not, I probably wouldn't pay for it. I'd wait for it to come onto streaming. But yeah, <laughs> this is fun. This was so much fun that I didn't expect to have. I had no idea what to expect from this. Like, I saw Kristen Wiig... And I'm and doing this sort of affectation. I'm like, oh no, what's this gonna be? I've been let down by this before. A lot of SNL alums do not get good stuff afterwards, and these movies tend to be really bad improv-driven, you know, stuff like underwritten stuff that just relies on the actors doing improv. Because hey, look, we did spend all this time in the Groundlings and the uh, Upright Citizens Brigade. We're gonna use that because rather than write stuff out we should not try we should just half-ass it yeah I've, I've gone off before about the Judd Apatowization of comedy and how it's how it's tainted the genre for the worse so that's a video for another day but yeah like Chris I wasn't sure what to expect and then when I finally got there Barb and Star were charming and fun I would watch a whole tv series of this I don't know if I would watch a movie series I feel like the movies would be expected to be bigger every time. I think just Barb and Star, you know, living their lives in Nebraska, and then every so often going off on, going off on like a road, like one season they do a road trip or something, and it's Barb and Star, you know, just having having silly adventures on the road or something. Like, oh, let's go see Cornhenge. <laughs> you know, like one, like the end destination is Cornhenge or the biggest ball of twine in Minnesota or something like that. You know. Uh, I don't think that's a real place. I think that's just something Weird Al made up. But point is, it's some, you know, like, minute, like, nothing kind of attraction. And they're just like, oh, that's where we want to go. Then we want to go there. <laughs> because it's amazing. <laughs> Low expectations. <laughs> oh. So, yeah, like, I would love more of Barb and Star. And it's just that I kind of, the, yeah, when they try to do this big epic plot, it falls flat. And I feel like if they just stuck with Barb and Star being Barb and Star, it would have been amazing. They didn't need to go big. But I think going big is kind of the point is in that it's campy and silly and over the top. And so even when it doesn't work, it kind of works because at least they, because, because they were trying at least. So yeah, Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mar is uh, my pick of the week. I used to do that too. I used to do picks of the week and Unpop Kernels. So um, Unpop Kernel would be I Care A Lot. And then the pick of the week would be Barb and Star Go to Vista Del Mar. Highly recommend it. F whole lot of fun. Just absolute bundle of fun. Next week, we've got the new Tom and Jerry movie, which could go either way. As long as it's better than the, the, than the first Tom and Jerry movie, then we're fine. Uh, we've also got the latest from the Russo Brothers over at Apple Plus, Cherry, uh, featuring Tom Holland. That should be interesting. As well as the new Billie Holiday movie, The People vs. Billie Holiday, which deals with her 
drug possession trial, and it's sort of this pre-official war on drugs, war on drugs uh, tale. So I'm very curious to see how that hap- how that plays out. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff also floating around. There's a whole deluge of stuff on Netflix that I'm trying to keep up with. And uh, we'll see what else comes about. Until then, I'm John Bailey. And remember, when you're stuck in a time loop because you exploited the elderly, take your super-powered squirrel on the road to Vista Del Mar. See you later, folks. not bad. This episode of Popcorn Junkie not brought to you by the all right taste of Cherry RC. Repeating the same day over and over again. And you do not need RC Cola. You do not need to drink this. You're my producer. You do not need to drink my soda.